Good morning everybody and welcome to Inside Outside webinar um, today on Wednesday during Mental Health Week um, and it's quite appropriate that today we're uh, discussing a topic that's um, quite a large issue when it comes to our mental health and AOD clients. So today, uh, first of all, I would of course like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay our respects to elders past, present, present and emerging and of course extend that welcome and acknowledgement to people that may be joining us in the room today and of course on webinar land, welcome to yourselves as well. So today it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you um, Professor, Associate Professor Coral Gardner um, from the School of Public Health and U uh, University of Queensland who's come along today to discuss the great vape debate for us. So please uh, put your hands together and welcome Associate Professor Coral Gardner today. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, what is probably the most divisive and polarised topic in the tobacco control field and it's getting a lot of um, air, air time at the moment I guess. Um, so I'll I'll go through um, the history of um, the tobacco harm reduction debate, or the history of tobacco harm reduction and um, discuss some different products that have been um, proposed for harm reduction and uh, discuss some um, sort of the health risks, the evidence we have on health risks of vaping, um, which is like using an e-cigarette or a um, other type of vaporizer, and um, the potential benefits of switching, and looking at some of the sort of arguments for and against promoting this as a harm reduction method uh, for smokers. And finally at the end, hopefully I'll have some time to just let you know about some um, current research that we're um, doing in this space. So I do have a lot of slides, so I'll probably talk fairly quickly and run through the material um, fairly quickly so I apologize in advance for that okay so um, I think it's always good to just start with thinking about how did we end up in this situation with smoking anyway so how did um, the cigarette epidemic happen I mean before cigarettes were um, mass-produced um, tobacco related disease really wasn't um, a, the big public health ep epidemic and problem that it is today. So um, when they discovered uh, flu curing um, of tobacco made it easier for um, inhaling the tobacco into the lungs which made cigarettes more palatable and um, this was a very fast um, and efficient way to, to deliver nicotine to your brain is going through the lungs. Once they invented a cigarette rolling machine, the Bonsac cigarette rolling machine, that made it possible to produce these cigarettes uh, very cheaply and then mass market them. Um, cigarettes are very convenient, you can carry them around with you and smoke them um, very easily and um, there was of course aggressive um, marketing and branding of cigarettes and so this all led to a big uptake in smoking and um, pretty soon we, we ended up with the problem that we have today. So um, of course the uh, harms of smoking started to become known in about the 1950s um, and through into the 1960s when some major reports were um, produced and published and so then people started to realise you know there is probably a bit of a problem with um, all these people smoking so what are we going to do about it? Um, the main problem here is of course that cigarettes don't just deliver nicotine. Um, they're a dirty nicotine delivery device they deliver 4,000 plus chemicals um, in the smoke along with the nicotine and it's all these carcinogens and toxins in the tars and particulate matter in the cigarette smoke that are the main causes of the lung cancer, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the heart disease that drives this big burden of tobacco related disease that we see. So um, an addiction psychiatrist in the UK famously said people smoke for nicotine but they die from the tar. So because we have this um, situation where people are wanting to use nicotine which is the main psychoactive ingredient that causes the addiction from cigarettes but we have all these extra toxins and problems in the, um, in the cigarettes, you know, it seems like this might be a logical way to reduce harm is by cleaning up the delivery system. So um, this was actually the approach that um, was supported early on, both in the um, public health community and uh, in the tobacco industry. Um, so they started looking at this issue and they were doing lots of studies to try and understand what it was um, that caused the, the lung cancer and so on. So here's um, from some um, internal industry documents um, from Philip Morris. 
So we've got scientists saying, you know, oh, evidence is building up that heavy smoking contributes to lung cancer. He then recommends an all synthetic aerosol to replace tobacco smoke if necessary. I know this sounds like a wild program, but I'll bet that the first company to produce a cigarette claiming a substantial reduction in tars and nicotine will take the market. So, you know, this is going back into the late 1950s. They were already thinking about, you know, that we could potentially have a product that's um, delivered the nicotine, but in a, a cleaner um, delivery system, a synthetic aerosol. Sounds very much like the e-cigarette products we have today. Um, there was also actually public health support for a tobacco harm reduction approach, including in Australia, so um, in the UK and US and so on, there, there was support for um, trying to reduce the harms from smoking without just pushing an abstinence only a goal. Um, so in Australia, um, actually the Cancer Council Victoria were behind pushing for uh, tar yields to be printed onto um, cigarette packs with the hope that that would then drive the industry to produce low tar um, cigarettes and that that would then um, reduce harms, that people would flock to the lower tar thing and obviously, you know, if you've got less tar coming out of the cigarette, you know, that's where the carcinogens is, that should lead to less um, uh, harms from smoking. Of course, the problem with this is it's very difficult to actually reduce or remove just the toxins from the cigarette smoke. Um, so, you know, um, the carcinogens are just, and you know, the other harmful constituents are all throughout it. So, um, Philip Morris sort of said, well, it's, you know, practically impossible because the, the smoke is so complex and contains all this myriad of, of um, um, other toxic substances. So the problem is if you had something that was a really good filter, it was probably going to take out the nicotine as well, and then people wouldn't want to smoke the product. So the tobacco industry uh, switched their focus. So instead of trying to actually reduce the harms, they fo focused on the appearance of reduced harm. So here's another tobacco industry document. All work in this area should be directed towards providing consumer reassurance about cigarettes and the smoking habit. This can be provided in different ways, e.g. by claimed low deliveries, by the perception of low deliveries, and by the perception of mildness. So you can see here there's quite a change between actually um, focusing on trying to reduce the harms to um, producing products that just appear to reduce the harms. So we had products like filtered cigarettes come on the market. Um, this is another industry document. So in most cases, however, the smoker of a filter cigarette was getting as much or more nicotine and tar as he would have gotten from a regular cigarette. He had abandoned the regular cigarette, however, on the grounds of reduced risk to health. So here we've got, again, filters were designed to be faulty because, again, if you blocked everything, then why would you smoke it? So um, this is a classic example, the um, Kent Micronite filter, which contained asbestos. So you got yourself a double whammy there, even that was being promoted as being um, good harm um, protection for your health. Um, next we had light and low tar cigarettes. And so these achieve their um, lower tar readings when you smoke it in a machine by adding uh, little ventilation holes in the uh, filter in the mouthpiece. So as you draw, inhale from the end of the cigarette, air comes in the side and it kind of dilutes the smoke. So when you smoke it in a machine under a very standardised puffing regimen, it um, produces quite low uh, yields of tar, nicotine and so on. But of course, people don't smoke like machines. So um, if, you've, if you're a regular smoker, you have a certain level of nicotine addiction and you're going to try and get your you know, nicotine quota so that you feel comfortable. So people would puff harder on the cigarette. They'd um, cover up the, the holes were very conveniently placed so that you could cover them up with your lips. So you could still get the, um, um, the smoke through like a regular one. Um, I've also heard of people taping up when they've worked it out, actually putting tape over it. So they've just turned their light cigarette into a regular cigarette. Um, and again, yeah, the, uh, you know, puffing it down to a smaller length and, um, and inhaling deeper with it. And the evidence is that people who, um, like, um, these products actually took the market, you know, so these are the, uh, most people smoke light, light cigarettes um, than regular full strength cigarettes now. And 
you know, it's, it's just a perception of um, lower risk, but it actually doesn't deliver lower risk. So um, these products are not true examples of harm reduction products. So as you can see, like, people can get the same um, yields from their cigarette, and it's um, with the move over to these products, the um, patterns of uh, lung cancer have changed, different types of lung cancer, because people tend to inhale more deeply with these, they have to draw on it harder to get the same level of um, uh, nicotine because it's diluted from the side. So it hasn't reduced lung cancer, it's just changed the type of lung cancer. So just some conclusions about um, safe cigarettes. Um, filtered and light cigarettes, um, they, they didn't work because um, people could compensate in how they smoked. Um, they had the appearance of reduced harm, but there was no benefit at all to the user. And it's unlikely that um, you can substantially reduce the harms of combustible cigarettes. So they're just such a uh, dangerous nicotine delivery system that you could maybe tweak it and reduce it a little bit. There are some things you could probably do with the carcinogens, but they would still be an uh, unacceptably harmful product. So next we'll look at some other options that have been trialled. So these are modified cigarettes. Um, so here's a couple of examples. Um, so we'll start with the first one, which is Premier, which had um, tobacco um, pellets in, in it. With um, At the end is a charcoal, little charcoal piece that, that you'd light with a um, cigarette lighter. Um, but it wouldn't actually burn the cigarette down, it just heat up the tobacco in the cigarette and um, you know, the idea would be that you, if you're not combusting it, it's not burning at the high, um, high rate, you'll have less of the um, like toxins like particulates and so on, it'll all be reduced a bit. So there were some issues with this. People didn't know how to light it properly. Um, they said it tasted like charcoal. Um, and they had a, a bit of a battle with the FDA. And this is an, an interesting thing that's um, got relevance for the whole harm, re um, harm reduction debate with vaping as well um, about whether it should be regulated as a drug. So this is one of the things that um, the tobacco companies have tried to avoid going down the you know synthetic aerosol path because they realise that as soon as they do that they're admitting that they're selling a nicotine delivery device in, in cigarettes and then that made them potentially subject to FDA regulation as a therapeutic good, as a drug. So, and they want to avoid that at all cost. Um, so then we had other um, variations of this. Eclipse, it's just um, a very similar product to the previous one, but a slight improvement. Um, issues with this, such as um, glass fibres in, in the filter that you're inhaling. Um, and then the latest one, which is um, Revo, which they test marketed in 2014 and 15, but it was basically a market flop, so that's gone. Um, Philip Morris went a different route. So those ones were RJ Reynolds products. This one is Philip Morris. So they went with heating um, these modified cigarettes in an electrical device. So um, you, you'd put it in, in the device, press button, heat it up and, and puff on it, or else it was activated by puffing. Um, we did have a, um, a product like this heat bar sold in um, 2004 and to 2008 in uh, Victoria in a Philip Morris concept store. So at the time, um, Christopher Pine was the um, Parliamentary Secretary for Health and he even issued a press release uh, welcoming Philip Morris's interest in tobacco harm reduction and saying it's a good thing and encouraging them to sell their product here. So, and he announced, no, there was no need for um, regulation. Um, this can just be sold like cigarettes. So um, that was on the market for a little while. So, and as you can see, it's quite a big chunky um, product with a little cigarette in the end there. Um, so that didn't stick around, but they've developed a, a more slimline version of this called ICOS. And um, again, this works the same way. It heats up the cigarette stick to release um, a tobacco vapor that people can inhale. Um, similar to smoking. So um, this has been test marketed in Japan and a few other countries uh, and it's actually taken off in Japan um, and been accompanied with large declines in smoking, uh, well large declines in cigarette sales. I think that's the data that I've seen is, is just on the cigarette sales. So it looks like um, it's getting some market uptake and potentially um, reducing the, the um, cigarette sales in uh, Japan. So this again, you know, uh, there has been some um, toxicological studies and so on done on it. It's mostly tobacco industry studies. There have been, I think, a 
few um, independent studies have been done, but it does look like it has lower um, exposures from this, but it's still early days with them. But interestingly, um, Philip Morris um, were trying to sell this product in New Zealand and um, they were told they couldn't sell it because it um, wasn't intended for smoke. So only smoke tobacco is given an exemption for sale in New Zealand, which is a bit like here. And so um, they were told they couldn't sell it, so they took New Zealand to court and they won. So um, it's and it was interesting they did this because even before the court case, New Zealand had already said that they were going to legalise all these products. So it was um, that they were just developing the regulatory framework for it. Uh, but obviously Philip Morris didn't want to wait for that and so they pushed ahead. And that's how um, vaping basically got legalised um, in New Zealand in terms of it actually like the start date. So once that court case came through, the New Zealand government said, oh, um, they weren't going to um, oppose it because they were planning to legalise it anyway. So they've just gone ahead with it. So this product will, I assume, will be sold in New Zealand soon. There is an ICOS New Zealand website already. So that's interesting. So will it come to Australia? So um, now previously, um, you know, we had the precursor to this sold in Australia, but um, it looks like the government currently aren't too keen on this product being sold. So um, David Gillespie has said, when asked about it, you know, that the department's of the view that these exemptions would not apply to these heat not burn products um, because the nicotine wouldn't be in the form of tobacco prepared and packed for smoking. So at the moment, I think it's um, a, a little bit up in the air whether um, whether we will get those products here. Um, there are also other products um, that do the same thing, essentially, but not with um, uh, cigarette-like um, sticks that go in them. So we've got this um, product started, um, this plume product um, by a company called Pax. And um, this was a couple of entrepreneur student, master's students um, in, I think it was a like, business faculty that developed this as their business project, um, developing a, a vaporising device for tobacco or, you know, other um, organic matter. Um, I think this is mostly used for cannabis. Um, but they did put, um, produce a product with um, these pre-filled little pods, like a coffee pod. Um, and that was sold off to Japan Tobacco International in 2011. Um, but other than that, the other ones are all, so the lady there is using a, a plume device, a PAX device, uh, are ones that you pack in yourself with, um, with loose tobacco. And you can get a wide variety of these products now, again, particularly as I guess cannabis legalisation is expanding in certain countries. Um, there's a bigger demand for these um, alternative delivery systems for them, so you can pack your loose organic matter into all of these. There's no reason why you can't use them with tobacco. Um, they, they often say that that's what it's intended for. Um, so these ones would probably be legal in Australia. I can't see why they would get caught up in the um, Schedule 7 um, classification because they don't actually contain tobacco or nicotine in them. So the health risks are a bit uncertain. It's probably lower than smoking. Um, I would think it's probably greater than vaping nicotine e-liquid. Um, but we do have a lack of research on these types of products. So most of the research has been on the you know, pre-packaged stuff, not things like this where you put your own material in it. Okay, so the next category of product we have is um, the non-tobacco vaporising devices. So um, if we go right back to, again, where people were <coughs> looking at this issue of um, trying to deliver nicotine without tobacco, um, there was someone that developed a um, sort of like a fake cigarette with just um, a filter paper soaked in nicotine that you could just sort of inhale on. So just a mechanical thing. It wasn't, um, didn't produce any vapour or anything like that. Um, there were some problems with it. Um, apparently, you know, the nicotine wasn't in a um, form that was particularly stable, so it became bitter. Um, and again, FDA stepped in and said this is an unapproved drug, and so that was the end of it. So you can see the problem here is, you know, once you go too far into the cleaning up the nicotine delivery system, then medicinal regulation kicks in, and that's usually the end of the story. Um, so here's an example of one that did 
go through and get approved. So this is, uh, I guess, the same sort of principle as the previous one, which is just um, the Nicorette inhalator. Um, so, you know, it's just got um, a nicotine solution soaked in a sponge that you draw air through the tube and get the nicotine that way. So initially this was available on prescription, but now you can just, um, since 2011, you can buy it in any general retailer. And um, I'm sure you've all come across th this, this product. So I guess this is a good example of um, what you get with medicinal regulation. You get a product that doesn't taste good, doesn't look particularly good, and um, doesn't work particularly well. It's got low nicotine delivery um, because they're worried about abuse liability in terms of sustained use. So these are all the things that um, mean that it's got limited um, attractiveness for consumers. So, but again, this is, this is often what the um, outcome of um, medicinal regulation is. In 2003, we did have um, the sort of what's considered the first e-cigarette products with this uh, Chinese pharmacist called Hon Lik, who developed um, an electronic smoking uh, device with nicotine in it. Ruyan was what he called it, and uh, he was a heavy smoker uh, whose father died of lung cancer, and so he was looking for something that would help himself. Um, so. Uh, this is kind of widely seen as the first um, e-cigarette and uh, he sold it off to Imperial Tobacco in 2013. Um, so they probably purchased it for the, um, you know, the rights and then they, I think they've, they've tried to take some of the other e-cigarette companies to court over sort of copyright infringement and stuff. So um, with this, you know, once um, it w it, the idea was out there, you know, you had a, a wide range of these what we call cigarettes um, come on the market, so they're all designed to look like a cigarette um, and they've just got like a nicotine solution with propylene glycol and glycerol in it sometimes um, and the, these were the early ones that were marketed as a smoking alternative rather than a drug delivery system, like a, a therapeutic good. So it was often marketed as uh, emphasising that you could use it anywhere that you, your smoking is banned. So it wasn't so much promoted as health, um, more of just you know, something else to do. Um, we also then had all the marketing that goes with trying to commercialise a product like this, a non-therapeutic product. And so this is um, particularly where uh, I guess the public health community started to get a little bit concerned. Oh, more than a little bit concerned. Um, so you can see some of the, um, you know, the, the sort of glamorisation, um, and people being concerned about, you know, suddenly like smoking's promoted as cool again, the whole idea of renormalising smoking again through these, and also the promotion that, well, you can use this wherever, so with um, like counteracting smoking bans in public places, that, you know, you could just use this as an alternative product uh, where smoking's banned, and then you can smoke um, uh, where you, um, you know, when you're at home or something like that. So those previous products that were up there, they were all independent companies. So then the tobacco industry, they were kind of a bit late to the game. Um, so they, I guess they weren't really sure what they wanted to do with this and seeing how it took off. So they started buying up some of these previous companies, but they also then started um, producing their own uh, e-cigarette brands. So here are some examples here. It's like a, Reynolds product, um, a Philip Morris product, and a BAT product there. And again, you know, they're kind of like sort of your cigarette type of products there. Um, so the regulatory response to all of this has been to start off trying to enforce medicinal regulation again, like we've seen in the past. So the uh, FDA in the States tried to regulate um, the e-cigarettes as a drug delivery device, but of course the industry uh, you know, fought back and appealed that, and there was a court ruling that um, they could own, that the FDA could only regulate it as a tobacco product unless uh, therapeutic claims were made. So in the states, these are um, labelled as tobacco products, um, which can get a bit confusing sometimes. Um, they, they like the uh, in literature and so on, they tend to to describe them as tobacco products, but they don't actually have tobacco in them, they've got nicotine extracted from tobacco. But they also enforce it on the um, products that don't have nicotine in it as well, which is also a bit confusing. Um, so currently 
In terms of the tobacco product regulations that are going to be applied by FDA, they haven't been enforced yet. They're still working on it. So they've announced, they've had like deeming regulations announced, um, and they were meant to come into force, but a new uh, FDA commissioner came in and he um, pushed back the date of when that would come into force. So there's a lot of uncertainty still about what exactly is going to happen. Because if the regulations do come in, it'll probably take most of the current products off the market. Okay, so um, also in the UK, the uh, Medicines uh, Healthcare Regulatory Authority, I think I've got that right, um, announced that they were going to enforce light touch medicinal regulations. So it'll be like, a, like what's enforced currently on nicotine replacement therapies, which is over the counter sales and so they wouldn't have to produce the same range of like clinical trial evidence they just have to demonstrate sort of manufacturing quality um, and that it actually delivered the nicotine like they said it was and then they'd be able to sell it like a nicotine replacement therapy. So British American Tobacco actually got approval for two products one is a um, one called Vogue wasn't actually an electronic cigarette it was a uh, pressurized nicotine inhaler and they also developed an, um, another product called Evoke, which was an electronic version of it. So they got approval for both of these as therapeutic goods, um, but they didn't actually go to the step of commercialising it. Um, so sort of while all this was happening, they got their um, approvals. There was um, some European legislation came in, the Tobacco Products Directive, um, which provided an alternative to non-medicinal regulation. So it set up um, that, like a more in the tobacco um, type of regulation for um, e-cigarettes and related products. So this kind of produced two options that you could, if you wanted to make therapeutic claims, go down the medicinal route, or you could just uh, apply through the tobacco products directive route, which was um, as a non-therapeutic product as well. So. I guess once that happened, there was less um, incentive for tobacco companies to bother with the medicinal one because the market share is probably going to be a lot smaller with this type of product than with um, sort of products that they can produce as a um, just a non-therapeutic product. So meanwhile, while all this is happening, um, the independent sort of vape industry was kind of evolving beyond these like little cigarette-like products and developing products that were more focused on better nicotine delivery and um, more sort of customization and so on and less like looking like cigarettes. Um, so I guess vaping had become accepted and become like a bit of a um, activity and a hobbyist type of activity that people didn't care so much anymore about whether it looked like a cigarette because this was a new thing to do. So we suddenly got these sort of um, modifi you know, uh, modified devices that are um, bigger, bigger tanks and that, that you could fill yourself. So you can do, you know, um, mix your own. So you can be like, um, it's a bit like, you know, making your own beer or wine at home. You can also mix your own e-liquid. Um, you can also, you know, people make their own coils and things like that that go into the device. So there's all these hobbyist aspects as well, which is an interesting um, sort of um, part of part of it, um, the whole field. So those sorts of products start coming on the market. And, you know, most of the regular um, people who vape um, started moving to these better functioning devices. Um, the tobacco industry, again, could see where the um, field's going and they've started now developing, you know, sort of copying these other uh, products as well. So now they're selling not just the cigar lights but a wider range of products including some refillable ones. So they prefer the ones with, um, you know, capsules and so on so they have control over, over the product obviously. But um, they do have refillable devices. So th this is sort of an example of the range of products that um, the tobacco companies are also producing. We also have, um, in the midst of all of this, the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World, which was um, set up by Philip Morris International. So they've committed 80 million uh, US annually for 12 years. Um, they also combined this with an advertising campaign claiming that they were getting out of the cigarette business that their ambition was to stop selling cigarettes. They took out a whole lot of big 
ads in um, UK newspapers start saying that that was what they were intending to do. And of course they were going to move to these uh, lower risk products. They recruited some high, prof high profile people in this, like um, Derek Yak is the director of it. Um, so he's ex um, WHO. Uh, John Seffron has also been promoting it and he's the ex-CEO um, of the American Cancer Society so they've got some big names on here. This is highly controversial and highly divisive. Um, there's lots of questions about you know what they're funding and what um, probity there is over it and also why they're funding this and so it's really this is also really split the tobacco control um, community. So most institutions, thankfully the one I'm at, also applies the same rules as they do for straight out tobacco industry funds. So um, we don't accept money from Foundation for Smoke Free Will. Other people have, um, and it's just become um, highly divisive because again, it's a way for the sort of the tobacco industry to try to insert themselves into into the debate and um, try to claim that they're really looking out for your health. So, um, and of course they're doing all this while they're still selling cigarettes all around the world and increasing their market share in um, low and middle income countries. So um, some of the conclusions about the big tobacco involvement in the vape market, they've been a relative latecomer. So this hasn't been generated by the tobacco industry. They've just jumped on board. Uh, initially, they started purchasing successful independent e-cigarette companies and developed their own brands. And they're also moving into trying to um, position themselves as market leaders. Um, um, interestingly, um, there's this perception that most of the products are tobacco industry products, but that's not the case. They're actually not um, the main um, producers of vaping products. Most of them are still independent. But um, there's a perception that it's just the tobacco industry, but that's not completely true. Um, you know, they've probably got lots of motives for doing this. I can only speculate as to what their motives are. Um, might be having a bet each way. You know, if this thing takes off, they don't want to be left behind like, you know, Kodak. Um, they want to remove a potential competitor product. They don't want people moving off to some other company's products. Could be a bit Machiavellian, you know. I think the best way to um, get the public health community to oppose this and try to shut it down is actually to support it. So there's a um, principle that's sometimes said, you know, the industry screen test. So if you try to introduce a regulation or um, some kind of policy and the industry start jumping up and down, it must be really good because um, they, you know, they're not happy about it. Um, but you know, it could go the other way. You know, so it also goes the other way. If they support, seem to support something, well, then it must be really bad for public health because the industry like it. So um, I don't know what they're doing there. Whether that's also part of it. They could also be trying to reinvigorate declining markets. So, for example, Australia's a market in decline for the tobacco industry. Um, you know, they, they can't, they, there's very few avenues, if any, for them to promote mar their market, their, their products and so on. Um, so this is potentially seen as a, another growth sort of area. Um, it's also creating a lot of disunity in the tobacco control field and I think that's uh, um, an important part of this, why they're um, getting so noisy about it is because um, this is one of their strategies, you know. Um, the kind of cohesiveness of the tobacco control field in opposing them and bringing in effective uh, regulation is something that they want to um, try and disrupt as much as possible. So that's probably a bit of, it could be a bit of all of that. Again, I'm just speculating. Uh, <clears throat> interestingly though, um, these people are often ignored or dismissed, but um, there's a, a role of consumers here. Um, so often um, consume, the consumer voice has just been dismissed as being, well, they're just stooges of the tobacco industry. They're kind of written off. But um, that's not the case. Um, and a lot of the uh, independents were actually smokers who quit by vaping. And then they've got, you know, developed this. And this is, you know, they're very passionate about this because they feel like this has saved their life. You know, they feel like they've had an improvement in their health, they've switched this product, you know, why why doesn't public health support them? Um, so there is this big um, consumer movement as well in the independent vape companies. So remember, they, uh, it was an independent, it was, um, 
The background to most of these um, products was uh, independent of the tobacco industry. So this didn't start with the tobacco industry, even though they were, you know, early on they discussed this back in the 50s, um, they decided not to pursue it back then. Um, so they've only gotten involved now after other people have de uh, developed these products and, and generated a market. So um, most of the manufacturers um, like Enjoy, Jewel, um, Inokin, Joytech, so Jewel is actually the same people who developed that PAX device, interestingly. Um, they're, they're not tobacco industry uh, companies. So um, the consumers have formed these consumer advocacy organisations and they can be quite aggressive um, in promoting um, vaping. And that's also um, developed uh, animosity with the public health community. I think it's really sad because these are the people that public health should be working with, you know, people who've had that lived experience of smoking, having difficulty smoking and quitting, and this is what's worked for them. And, you know, it. Um, so there has been a, um, like a bit of a, oh, I mean, this is part of the whole debate, I guess, and it's become quite um, toxic in terms of the interaction with consumers between some public health people and so on. So it's a bit, I think it's a bit sad um, but there are these independent organisations out there that are in the mix. So it's not just simply big tobacco, there's all these different players. Um, so if we just go through what the main arguments are, um, so you know, it depends how you see it. You can see it as a threat or an opportunity. So there were, whole, uh, there were a group of scientists who wrote a letter to Margaret Chan, who, uh, who was the WHO director at the time, saying, you know, because um, WHO was starting to clamp down a bit on, um, you know, encouraging com um, countries to uh, go hard on, on these products. Um, and so they're saying, well, you know, there, there could be an opportunity here, don't just dismiss it. And then there was another group of scientists and um, academics and so on who wrote an opposing letter. So you ended up with this big, you know, division going on. Um, so the things that people are worried about is that it could discourage people from quitting if you just keep using these products at the same time, could renormalise smoking, making it attractive and glamorous again. People are worried about children taking this up. You know, are you going to create a new generation of nicotine addicts? Um, there's also, there's increasingly um, a narrative about brain damage and the FDA have released, um, actually I probably should have put that in there, that, they're, they sort of blow your mind a bit watching these ads that they've produced. Um, these ads trying to, they um, show sort of the nicotine as being like parasites in your body and like all moving around under your skin and then going in your brain and everything. So they're quite, it's quite full on. Um, there's concerns that it might be a gateway to smoking. Young people start on these products and then move on to um, cigarettes course worried about addiction. Um, safety concerns about manufacturing standards. Um, some of these aren't made to very good standards. The early ones particularly though um, there's no oversight on them. They could have anything in them. I think it's improved a lot since then. Um, toxins and aerosols. So they're not completely clean products. They do produce some nasties. Um, exploding batteries, long-term um, safety data lacking, um, people are inhaling propylene glycol every day for many years. We don't really have data on that. And also child poisonings, if you have like nicotine liquid around in the house. Um, but there are some potential opportunities as well. So these could be attractive cessation aids for smokers. Could be a, a good long-term alternative for heavily addicted smokers that just haven't been able to quit by the existing methods. Could also provide a good um, opportunity to actually phase out cigarettes. If you've got a product, you know, like if we've got a, um, a less harmful product or lower risk product, why are we allowing the more harmful product to be sold? Um, regulation could be used to restrict glamorous promotion. So there's some things you could do to kind of reduce the threat um, and make it more of an opportunity. We, you know, we already know about how harmful cigarettes are. Um, so why aren't we doing something about that and using this in that way? Um, and there's a consensus that these products will be much less harmful. So there's a big consensus report produced by the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine in the US, very um, comprehensive report, about 800 pages where they looked at all the evidence. And yeah, they, they concluded that th the consensus is that these products would be far less harmful than smoking. Um, and you know, we could use regulation to address some of these safety concerns. 
So this also raises the issue of like, what's the end goal? So um, tobacco control of, has, it's not just about um, stopping smoking. Um, this is from Deb Deborah Arnott in the, um, the UK, the director of ASH. She said that you know there were three goals: to end the death and disease caused by tobacco, to end nicotine addiction, and to destroy the tobacco industry. So harm reduction doesn't really fit with those last two um, goals there because it's acknowledging that there may still be a role for um, tobacco product, well, you know, nicotine products that the tobacco industry may sell, and also ongoing nicotine addiction. Um, this is another quote that I think is interesting from um, Matthew Meyer's campaign for tobacco-free kids, who doesn't actually support um, e-cigarettes, but um, this is something he said in a newspaper article. Uh, the challenge to me is not to eliminate smoking, but the death and disease from smoking. That should be the end goal. If you had a product that addicted 45 million people and killed none of them, I would take that deal. Then you'd have coffee. I have to believe that the marketplace incentives were such that over time someone could devise a product that would give the same satisfaction as tobacco but didn't kill them, people would flock to it. So even for people who are a bit sceptical at e-cigarettes, e there's still some interest in, well, maybe addiction isn't the biggest issue here and that maybe if there was a product that was able to um, addict people but not kill them, that mightn't be so bad. So I guess this raises the question about, you know, is this just coffee that we're talking about here and we shouldn't really be too concerned about it? Um, there are, I, I don't think it's coffee, <laughs> um, but I also don't think that it's tobacco cigarettes, something in between. So there are some acute risks, there are some risks of like say overdose, um, but Mostly these are self-limiting, so people tend to adjust it because they start feeling pretty sick. If they, if they have too much of this stuff, they start feeling nauseous, headachy and so on before they get to the point of actually uh, killing themselves with it. There have been some accidental poisonings. Unfortunately, I think there's been two child deaths related to um, nicotine e-liquids and there have been people um, injecting it and um, suicide attempts. Some of them have been um, uh, successful. Um, there's also issues with batteries, so same as you know your Galaxy tabs that blow up. Um, this can also happen with any lithium-ion battery, including these devices. So it's still relatively rare. It's also important to keep in mind that even though this is quite a um, what would you say um, dramatic sort of potential outcome, that the risk of fire from these products is much less than the risk from smoking. And actually the uh, UK, London um, Fire Department have been promoting um, people switching to e-cigarettes because it could decrease fires. Um, so, you know, this sort of thing is something where regulation's got a place to play. So this is some advice that's been put out by the FDA on sort of avoiding battery explosions. So developing some good manufacturing standards would help here. Um, evidence on long-term safety. We have some, um, you know, uh, evidence on vapour constituents, biomarkers of exposure, self-reported health status, case reports, case series, but we don't have any, oh, sorry, we don't have any long-term epidemiological studies. So. Um, there's a bit of a lack of safety data there. So there's some unknowns. In terms of long-term cancer risk, there's some conclusions here that there's probably some risk, but likely to be much less than cigarette smoking because you do have some of the same chemicals that can cause um, cardiovascular risk in the vapour. Also with uh, respiratory risk, there's probably still some respiratory risk, but there's been um, evidence of lower, um, like the important lung carcinogens, like NNAL, lower levels in the vape, much lower levels than um, in the um, cigarette smokes. And also some studies with people with COPD that have found an improvement in their quality of life after switching. Cancer, um, so this was a study that tried to um, calculate cancer potency compared to cigarettes and also the heat not burn products and nicotine replacement therapy. So they looked at all the um, chemicals in the vapour compared to in the smoke and they came up with this estimate of uh, less than 1% the risk of smoking for cancer. So, so of course, safer not to use anything. Um, there's some evidence that um, you could achieve health gains by switching from smoking to vaping and this is kind of backed up with anecdotal reports from people who've switched and found improvement in their health. Um, 
The Royal College of Physicians in the UK estimate that the risk would be no greater than 5% of the risk of smoking, but there's a lot of uncertainty about this. So I'm hoping also that um, my research and that will contribute to improving on these estimates. Um, and you know, there were some things that we could do to probably reduce the risk further. So there's some concerns about the flavours. We don't have a good good evidence on the harms of inhaling flavours that you usually ingest. So you know, the safest thing would probably be to vape unflavoured e-liquid, like just glycerol. Um, vaping at higher nicotine strength seems to result in lower exposure because you don't need to, as much of the aerosol to get your nicotine dose. So the studies they've done with looking at, um, I guess, the um, P of people who are vaping at different levels, uh, it seemed that the, the high, people who vape higher strength might actually have lower exposure. Um, and vaping with lower power, so the hotter the coil is, you're burning more of the liquid and that's when you're producing the more the nasty chemicals. And of course, you know, encouraging people to stop as soon as they feel confident that they don't need it to stop returning back to smoking, you know, because it's the long term use that um, is where we don't know and where there's likely to be risk. Um, so the current debate in Australia is, I've got time to go through, is about how we regulate these products. And at the moment you can't sell the products with nicotine very easily. So um, internationally these products are sold with, with or without nicotine as a consumer product rather than um, as a medicine in most of these countries like Europe, UK, USA, Canada and New Zealand. So I've just highlighted Canada and New Zealand there because they had very similar regulations to us in which you could only sell it as uh, medicine, um, but they've reversed that now. So they are now adopting the um, allowing people to sell these products with nicotine as a consumer product. And the US FDA um, announced that they would actually approach this as looking at the whole range of nicotine products and try to regulate on a continuum of risk with the goal of phasing out cigarettes. So they've also announced that they've got a plan to remove nicotine from combustible cigarettes and they're linking this with, well then we've got another, we've got a safer source that you can go to for your nicotine. And so they're seeing that that's a more um, palatable way to bring this in, uh, uh, this goal of reducing the nicotine in the tobacco um, by actually offering people an alternative product. Um, in Australia, the two highlighted ones there, uh, prescription only medicine and regulated poison, are the two options for nicotine and vape products. So you can see uh, it's either a um, dangerous uh, poison, which is if it's not a therapeutic good, that's essentially prohibition. We can't, you, we can't use that as a way of selling these products. Um, and so the Schedule Four medicine, so needing a medical prescription is the only other way. Um, there are none that have been approved by the TGA, so there are none domestically available for sale. There are some options with, um, un with regulations that allow the access to unapproved therapeutic goods, such as via personal importation or extemporaneous compounding, and there are some compounding chemists available, um, but both of these provide a prescription and of course also clinical trials. So some um, researchers are running clinical trials, so that would be another option for people who want to quit smoking via vaping. So who are the supporters of non-therapeutic regulation for nicotine vape products in Australia? So. Um, it's a really varied mix. <laughs> so firstly you have tobacco companies that have been um, promoting this um, and so but you know they've also shown interest in the medicinal route as well so they're not wholly um, committed to this they also can go the medicinal route that's that's fine for them um, but then you also have these sort of right-wing libertarian politicians and so on and their argument is more around personal freedom and you know if I want to vape I should be allowed to vape and whatever I want. But then you also have health professionals who are really concerned about long-term smokers, that they haven't had any um, success in um, helping them get off the smokes with the standard products. Is that all right? Okay. Um, so you've got some um, organisations like RANSIP um, and DANA and so on that have um, got a position statement now that they support widening access. And also there are public health um, researchers, so many of you probably um, know the name Alex Wodak. He's, um, very well known in the drug and alcohol space, so he's another person that's um, uh, quite supportive of um, widening access. So these products are already widespread, they're here in Australia as well, but it's all black market. Um, and you know, we might end up with, if we don't allow 
these products to be sold in a regulated way with other sort of heated tobacco products. So like in Japan, because Japan don't allow the nicotine e-cigarettes either, and that's why ICOS has taken off there. So that's the other thing that might happen here, is that we just end up with the heated tobacco product. Um, these products present both a risk and an opportunity. Um, currently, the current regulation is a bit perverse because it favours the most harmful product. So cigarettes, you can still sell anywhere in any corner store. Um, so it hasn't really, um, the current situation hasn't dealt with this more harmful product. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we could, um, we could develop some regulations that try to minimise some of the concerns that we have and um, maximise the opportunity. But we do need um, some more research. Um, so this is still an emerging field and we do need more, a lot more research on this. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm just about out of time. So um, I just thought I'd let you know about this trial that we're running, um, cessation and relapse prevention trial. So this is uh, an NHMRC funded clinical trial, it's open label and pragmatic, so we've got really loose uh, inclusion criteria and it's a crossover trial. So everyone who comes into the trial will get um, the opportunity to quit smoking with the vaping product. So it's very fair and equitable as well. Um, we're looking for 810 participants. Um, we're looking, we're particularly targeting people who uh, may have these health conditions. So we're looking for people with chronic um, complex comorbidities and these are the populations that we particularly are interested in and in recruiting. And um, the aims I've got here are that we're trying to compare, um, so it's a little bit of a different trial. So what we're trying to do is look at delivering vaping as part of first line therapy or as part of second line therapy. So in condition A, people can get the opportunity to use the vaporizer along with standard cessation treatment. So we also give them nicotine patches and quit line counselling. And then in condition B, we get them first to try and quit with um, nicotine patches and gum or lozenge and quit line counselling. And if that doesn't work at the six month follow up, then they can also have a second quit attempt with the vaping. So, um, and then we've also got another aspect to it, which is we're looking at relapse prevention. So people who want to keep using the product, the vaping product can actually, uh, will be able to access it for up to two years. So we can see if that helps people with a bit longer time to use the product. So the condition A is modelled after what happens in the UK. They've actually incorporated vaping into their clinical care for smoking cessation and the smoking cessation services actually will um, uh, support uh, patient preferences if they want to quit vaping, they actually let them do it and they incorporate it. Um, whereas condition B is kind of like the more conservative approach, you know, like use it as a last resort. So go away and try with the standard treatments. If that doesn't work, then we'll, we'll let you have a go with this. So, um, and then finally, this is just the um, uh, study website um, where you can get more information. And um, Biala will, will be a site which is good. And if you're from another clinic and you're interested in helping with recruitment, then um, yeah, please see me or contact me. Yeah. Thank you so Thank you for all the work. And so when you said other services can contact you, would that be through that website that you've got? There? Yes. Um, so uh, I've also, you know, uh, got got you know my card if people want my card or else if they just email me on that and just say they're interested in being a recruitment site. Fabulous. Um, we'll see if we've got any questions in the room. Um, Thanks very much Carl. It's interesting isn't it how much nicotine you need. Um, you implied that higher levels in your e-liquid of nicotine might reduce exposure to other things. And in the States, they're trying to reduce the nicotine content of cigarettes. Mm. And the generally accepted view has been, if you put less nicotine in, you simply have people smoking harder. So can you... Yeah, I know, it's fun. Can fine. you join that all together and explain what's happening, please? <laughs> yeah, so um, the, the studies that have been done where they've reduced the nicotine in the... So it's reducing in the tobacco, so not by, you know, like these little tricks of, like, putting holes in the filter and so on, but actually reducing the nicotine content of the tobacco. If you reduce it substantially, it does reduce 
exposure. And if you reduce it right, so the um, courts, the Supreme Court said that FDA aren't allowed to completely remove nicotine from cigarettes, but they can remove it down to sort of trace levels. Okay, so it's just gonna be very, very low. So the trials that have been done with the very low nicotine cigarettes look like it might be promising. So if you reduce it to the point where you can't compensate anymore, then people just abandon the product. And that's where I think they're seeing, particularly if you've got an alternative product, people can go to that rather than trying to go to the black market for the better um, hit from the tobacco. <laughs> yes. I just, oh. that, that um, the level of nicotine you can't compensate anymore, is that level of nicotine in cigarettes where you can't compensate anymore, 0.9 milligrams? I would have to look it up, it's pretty low. Um, I've understood people smoke one milligram cigarettes yeah. and not to smoke lower. Forget, forget the tar readings or nicotine readings on the cigarette packs, it's all the same, okay? That's just a trick that's done with the holes in the thing. So I just, yeah, that's meaningless. But um, I'd have to go, but I, I wouldn't like to just try it off the top of my head, tell you. But I think there's also, there's not actually exact evidence on at what point that it does, but... Are you telling me a cigarette company lied to me? Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Um, but yeah, so those those um, readings, like one milligram, two milligram, whatever, it's just meaningless. Any other questions in the room? I have one from webinar land. Um, so, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so the one that we've got uh, sent in is, uh, obviously mental health clients have uh, unfortunately higher rates of yeah. smoking than the national average. Are there any uh, trials planned to include mental health clients into, into the trials? Yeah, so we've been um, interested in this and trying to get funding for it through different routes and we haven't yet. Um, so I guess we've had the most success with getting funding for sort of substance use disorders. Um, but there may be in the future. Um, I know that, yeah, it's, um, there, there are uh, overseas, there have been su some pilot studies and so on. Um, uh, there are none currently. And you said you have fairly open scope for your trial. If yes. the numbers don't get up on the three areas that you're particularly looking for, would that be wide for them to be able to include in that, do you think? Um, yes, and um, they could contact me. Cool, thank you. <laughs> I'll have a conversation offline on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine, thank you. Is that it? Yes, thank you. If you'd just like to thank thank Coral for her good presentation today.